What does ancient wisdom tell us about this? Hippocrates has been attributed as saying that food is your medicine, let medicine be your food. Um, absolute rubbish. The reason it's rubbish is because this wasn't from Hippocrates. It's not stated in any of his works, even though many of us post it on our blogs, put it in our mailing lists. But that isn't actually from Hippocrates. So yeah, it may be true, but it's not from him. Here's a few things he did say. Walking is the best medicine. If we could give every individual the right amount of exercise, the right amount of nourishment, not too little, not too much, we will find health. That which is used develops, that which isn't used wastes away. If there's a deficiency in exercise, the body will become liable to disease. Eating alone will not keep a man well, he must also take exercise. There's a synergy between food and exercise and movement. Look well to the spine for the cause of disease. Mental health. If you're in a bad mood, go for a walk. If you're still in a bad mood, go for another walk. The London bus. This was the first time that modern science was aware of the relationship between sedentary living and chronic lifestyle disease. An epidemiologist noticed that bus drivers were three more times as likely to die from a heart attack than bus conductors. So bus conductors were the ones helping people on off the bus, giving people passengers tickets. And uh, this was the relationship. Three times more likely to die if you were sitting as a bus driver. And you were twice as likely to die from a heart attack if you had one. And the main difference between the two populations was the physical activity demands of a bus conductor daily in comparison to the other transport workers. And everything else is pretty much controlled. So diet was similar, demographics were similar, um, same levels of pollution, all the sort of stuff that you would try to control for, that was all matched apart from levels of physical activity. Fast forward into the present day, we now know that physical activity is one of the best interventions. There's a reduction in cardiovascular disease and mortality between 30 and 50 percent, better than any other intervention that we have available. Blood pressure. There's reduced hypertension risk of 50 percent. Cancer prevention. There's a reduction in cancer risk from 20 to 80 percent, depending on the type of cancer. The reduction in depression and anxiety risk, significant mental health benefits between 20 and 30 percent reduction in mental health issues. Reduced type 2 diabetes risk of up to 50 percent, reduction in insulin resistance, reduction in metabolic syndrome. Reduction in cognitive decline, you're less likely to suffer from Alzheimer's, less likely to suffer from cognitive decline, 30 to 45 percent risk reduction. Um, all the research is available on my website. If you want to look at the citations, primaplay.com forward slash research. So I want to talk to you about my first client. So my first client was one of the 75%. They were dealing with hypertension, prediabetes, high levels of visceral fat, cardiovascular risk markers through the roof, poor lipid profile, dealing with lots of pain, et cetera, et cetera. Not a happy individual. I mean, a lot of you know this individual worked in a very stressful investment banking environment, and that individual was myself. So part of the problem that I had working in this industry was very long sedentary days. 16, 18 hours was a, an average day, seven days a week, um, eating Snickers and drinking Red Bulls for breakfast. <laughs> and feeling rewarded when I got another monitor. By the time I left banking, I had nine screens and felt really proud of my status uh, in achieving that. This is me now. Um, I'm not the person I was 15, 16 years ago when I was told that I had all of these amber and red warnings in relation to my health. Uh, longevity is really important to me. And I tell you what, it doesn't really matter when you're 30, when you're 40, when you're 45, you know, doesn't, 
you don't think about it that much. But as soon as you hit a certain target age, so it's my 50th this year, trust me, I'm thinking about longevity. I'm thinking about making sure I can maintain good quality of life. So why was this the case? So we now know some of the underlying mechanisms as to why physical activity is important. Hypertension is the world's biggest silent killer. This is basically the reason why the heart strengthens, the heart becomes more efficient, blood pressure lowers as a result. That's pretty much that in a nutshell. Again, all the supporting evidence in relation to that. In the short term, you have an increase in blood pressure as you exercise, but chronic indications are that blood pressure comes down. What about my pre-diabetes? So I was one step away from full-blown type 2. Fasting glucose, insulin resistance, uh, A1C elevated. This is why exercise helps significantly. After exercise, you have a significant drop in blood glucose levels, 24 to 48 hours post-activity. You become more insulin sensitive. Resistance training and aerobic activity has that impact. There's a reduction in insulin resistance risk. If you're sedentary, you double your risk of metabolic syndrome. And the reason being is because up to 80% of your body's glucose demand is muscle tissue. That's what your body requires to mobilize, actually, is glucose. And if you're sedentary, you have a lot of blood glucose that isn't being used. Only 5% will be sent to fat tissue and about 10 to 15 to the liver. So most of your blood glucose demand is muscle tissue, muscle contraction, muscle utilization. Another advantage is you don't need insulin to reduce blood glucose levels. Is anyone aware of that? You eat some food, what happens? You eat some carbohydrates, there's an elevation of insulin. Agreed? Yeah. What do you do to bring that down? You wait until the food's digested, insulin secreted, it brings blood glucose levels down. Would you, is, that what, is that what you'd say? Well, yes, that's one mechanism. But there's another mechanism, which is called non-insulin-mediated glucose uptake. And that's activated by physical activity, by muscle contraction. So insulin isn't required, actually. There's an insulin-independent mechanism. If you want to research that, it's called GLUT4. That's the glucose transporter that can transport glucose into muscle cell in the absence of insulin. Very powerful mechanism. Weight-bearing activity from bone also expresses GLUT4 as well. What about lipid profiles? Again, lots of research on why there's a reduction in cardiovascular risk profiles, why you have better lipid profiles in terms of lower triglycerides, lipoprotein A is reduced, all of the atherogenic, highly inflammatory agents are reduced with physical activity, both aerobic and resistance training. Um, you have smaller, um, you have denser, less atherogenic particles, and you also have inflammatory markers like homocysteine, which is reduced. What about inflammation? Um, lots of people talk about exercise, and they say you've got to be so careful. If you exercise too much, you can just have this cascade of inflammation. Um, and so you should be doing more low intensity, more stress reducing activities. But the physical response, the physiological response from exercise, which actually is an increase in inflammation in the short term, is what provides the benefits. So the tearing of muscle, the breaking of bone that comes from activity, that inflammation promotes healing. That healing actually reduces inflammatory markers long term. So in the short term, you have DOMS, which is probably the, the most obvious signal of inflammation. You have muscle soreness from activity. But every single marker measurable in terms of inflammatory markers are reduced chronically. CRP, COX-2 inhibition, TNF-alpha, so cancer-promoting uh, markers, uh, cardiovascular inflammatory markers, cytokines, which also promote inflammation, those are all reduced based on muscle contraction as the activation. What about the gut microbiome? 
um, interestingly, control for diet. So you have the same individual, same individuals eating the same diet, and you have greater variation in the microbiome from one individual to the next. One indication of that can be the amount of physical activity undertaken. So there's research done on a group of rugby players where they had controlled nutrition, controlled supplementation, and the fittest, most active rugby players had up to 20% more microbial diversity. Um, and their peak VO2 max was what was associated with that increase in diversity in health-promoting bacteria. Uh, and if you're wondering what the underlying mechanism is there, one, you have a much more aerobically rich environment in the gut which promotes health-promoting bacteria. And secondly, there's creation of butyrate and other short-chain fatty acids from muscle contraction again. So without, in the absence of food, just some muscle contraction can create short-chain fatty acids in the gut. How much should we be doing? Anyone? What's the minimum we should be doing in terms of physical activity per week to promote good health? As biohackers, we should know this because it should be like pretty much the first thing we focus on. So why does no, why does no one know? Are you scared that I'm going to tell you you're wrong? That's a very good question. It depends on different body types, I guess. It, it, no, it doesn't depend on, well, of course, there's always a dependency on the individual, but in terms of the messaging you are likely to hear from public health bodies, from experts in their field, what would they say is the minimum you should be adopting? Um, 30 minutes a day? An hour a day. Okay, so it's, it's 30 minutes of moderate intensity, physical activity, five days a week. So 150 minutes per week. Okay, so if you do that and you feel pretty good about yourselves, you're still not meeting the minimum. Because the minimum also includes two days of resistance training. Whole body, multi-joint, multi-plane movement is also a minimum recommendation. Okay, if you're over 65, you should be doing more than that because you should also be doing exercise involving balance and fall prevention and the like. If you're 17 up to about five years old, it should be 60 minutes per day. If you're under five, it's three hours per day. So 150 minutes of moderate intensity. Most people don't know what moderate intensity means. What does it mean? It means different things for different people. A brisk walk might be moderate intensity. If you're relatively fit, moderate a brisk walk won't actually affect your health levels greatly because that wouldn't be moderate intensity for you. That would be low intensity activity. Resistance training uh, is a separate intervention that's required for movement. So how many take their medicine? How many, what's the percentage of adults do you say that, that meet the recommendations? Less than 10%? Well, it's actually reported as 35% of adults, okay? People filling in questionnaires, usually. Uh, the real answer is 5%. So when people are wearing accelerometers, when they're actually being tracked, only 5% of adults in the UK and the US meet the recommendations. And interesting, that 5% doesn't include resistance training. So it's likely to be even less than that. If you want to find out more as to why that is, I have a research paper that you can download which talks about why that is and a lot more of the supporting research. It's called No Play, No Gain. Um, and I gave a recent uh, uh, TEDx talk, Why Working Out Isn't Working Out. Um, that's got over half a million views so far, and that really delves into some of the reasons why people are not working out. <laughs> Here's one of the reasons. We're surrounded by messages telling us not to move. We have an environment like the one today where we're sitting down. It feels good to sit down, nice and comfortable and relaxed. It brings the heart rate down. We feel safe when we're sitting. Okay? Evolutionary fitness to dictate what we should be doing in terms of movement. The intensity, the variation, the diversity of movement, the volume of movement, should be dictated by what uh, the conditions we evolved under. Another thing which is important is not only the quantity of movement, but the quality of movement. Most people feel satisfied by 
doing whatever they're doing and they're not recognizing that sometimes they're not actually meeting the recommendations because the quality of their movement, the equipment that they're using, doesn't support what their body was designed to do. So they question, oh, I'm doing all this exercise and it's not working for me. It's usually because the quality of movement patterns are not what you should be focusing on. And this is also another summary as to why the primal play method was developed is because one, it does focus on primal, instinctive, universal movement patterns that we were all designed to do. It should be practical in nature. There should be movements that you can actually use in your day-to-day -day lives, not just in the gym. And I feel play and playfulness is something that's missing for much of our movement practice. Even for our kids, our kids are becoming like mini adults and are being told they should suffer when they're playing. Don't go outside, you're not allowed to do so, you're not allowed to do anything risky, you're not allowed to climb trees, you're not allowed to free roam. Many of our children are suffering because we've removed play very much from their lives. So what can you do about it? I have a book called Animal Moves, which discusses the philosophy and the way you can incorporate a lot of these movement patterns that we're designed to do, referencing the animal kingdom. So we should be strong. We should be fast. We should be able to climb, push and pull, lift and carry, sprint at great speeds, jump you know, certain distances, walk for great distances. These are movement patterns that we should all be capable of and all be able to do. I have a free download on my website on the importance of play. And I have products like the Animal Moves deck, which is like a fitness deck of cards, to just to make things a little bit more interesting. If you'd really like to know a lot more, I do have free consultations available where we can discuss individually where you'd like to take uh, your movement practice. So if you want to take a photo, um, that's a link you can access and you can find out a bit more about how movement coaching can help. So this in closing, uh, I would like us to do some movement at the end of the session. So if you could stand up, because fear is one thing, but taking action is far more important. So movement is increasingly optional in our modern environment. We can't escape being sedentary. We've got to work really hard to work around that. We know it can enhance our physical, mental, and emotional health. And it is one of the best preventative and therapeutic interventions available for chronic lifestyle disease. So with that, I'd like to demonstrate a couple of movement exercises, games. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Is Julia going to give me a couple of minutes to do that? Just go for it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I've got permission. I've got permission. Okay, so um, could I have somebody? I, I want somebody who's a gym bunny, preferably male. Pretty strong guy. Yeah, it is a strong guy. Yeah, come on. All right. So we're just going to do a really simple exercise. Okay. Uh, do you do like bench presses or? Yeah. So you can. Can you tell that he does bench presses? Yeah. You can see. Yeah. All right. So we're going to do something which kind of mimics a bench press, but just with one arm. Okay. okay? So we're going to clasp our hands. Okay. Just like that. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to push this way. Okay. And you're going to push that way. So get nice and get nice and grounded. So nice and steady. Okay. So something again that everyone can do. And all we're going to be doing is push, and you're going to push back. Push back. Okay, so it only works if you push back, my friend. Okay, so it's a little bit unfair because I'm locking my arm out, right? So I relax. Good. All right. So from this position, the goal is I push forward. Good. Push back. All right, so that's the goal. And if I want to make it easier for my partner, because, again, this is the first time he's done this. I do this all the time, so it's a little bit unfair. So I can... I can go like single leg, okay? So I'll stand on like a push, 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 push. I'm off balance now, push. Okay, so this is an example of what I mean of movement quality, okay? Thank you. So do you want to try that with your partner? Just face them. Thank you. He deserves a round of applause for that. No, I haven't met him, I haven't met him before. I'll pay you after, thank you. Um, so if you just face your partner, whoever it is, okay? Get nice and sturdy. And you're just going to be pushing and pulling. Everyone, if you find you're deadlocking, right, Ali, you know, both of you kind of like, no one's going anywhere, it's because both of you are deciding you don't really want to push the right? One of you is definitely stronger than the other, so don't be kind. Just go for it. Go, go, go.
Thank you.